God wants a relationship with you and me. That's a common theme all throughout the pages of the Bible. And as we come today to the beginning of chapter 19 in the book of Revelation, we also come to the end of another narrative cycle. And this time we see after the overthrow of the pagan world system, the celebration of the saints and the culmination of the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what we'll be focusing on today. So I hope that you'll be blessed and challenged. I'll be reading verses 1 through 10. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Alleluia! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped the God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. And then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Well, the story of Scripture is the story of God's relentless love for his people. It's the story of his faithfulness despite our faithlessness. From Genesis to Revelation, God is telling us one cohesive story about his love for his people, which includes their rebellion and his various acts of mercy and grace. And because God is a master storyteller, he's saving the best part for last. Well, today we come not to the end of Revelation, but to the end of another narrative cycle within Revelation. And as we've already seen, Revelation is composed of a series of apocalyptic narratives that recapitulate one another. In other words, this book is describing for us God's works within the world during the church age, from the first coming of Jesus to the second coming of Jesus. And these descriptions that we see later in the book repeat what came before only from different perspectives. So at the beginning of chapter 19, we come once again to the end of the current world order and the second coming of Jesus. But this time we see something that hasn't really been mentioned so far, something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the great feast that we will enjoy in the presence of God at the end of time. After the unrepentant have been sentenced to eternal judgment and Christ has remade heaven and earth. It can be easy to just read this section in chapter 19 rather quickly in order to move on to the dramatic scene of the rider on the white horse. But even though this marriage feast is only described with a few verses, its significance within the biblical storyline is monumental. To understand the full significance of this feast, we need to see how Scripture has been building up to this point ever since Genesis. And that it is here that many of God's promises to his people find their fulfillment. So last week we looked at chapters 17 and 18. And we saw how those chapters vividly describe the downfall of the pagan world system. The pervasive and systemic sin that we see within the world. And John was given two different visions with two symbols. The prostitute and Babylon which both symbolize the corrupt world system. 
And we saw that upon Jesus' return, he would destroy the sinful rulers of the earth and topple the kingdom of Satan. Because Babylon was built and sustained by violence, it will be thrown down with violence. And then, breaking the silence and stillness following destruction, John hears the angels in heaven praising the Lord at the top of their voices. So at the beginning of chapter 19, we have celebration in heaven for two main reasons. The first reason is because of what has just occurred here in the narrative. The world system has been thrown down. Corruption, injustice, violence, and persecution are no more. God has wiped the earth clean of sin and death. The heavenly host is celebrating the fulfillment of God's justice. Babylon has been thrown into the lake of fire. The world has been set right. And the Lord is ruling and reigning over every nation on earth. That alone is reason for rejoicing. But then look again at what else the great multitude shouts, starting in verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. So the shouts of the heavenly host are not just shouts of victory over Babylon, but also shouts of joyful anticipation as both the bride and the lamb descend upon the earth for the greatest marriage ceremony the world has ever seen. And as we see in verse 9, it's not just a marriage ceremony, it's a marriage feast in which all the people of God have been invited. This is the great feast that all of God's people should look forward to. In this scene, there are two characters who are being united in marriage. The Lamb of God, who is Jesus, and the Bride. Now, we've already been introduced to the Lamb in Revelation, but this is the first time that John mentions a Bride. Just as the Lamb is a symbol of Jesus as the perfect sacrifice for our sins, the Bride is also symbolizing something. The Apostle Paul gives us a clue to what that is in Ephesians 5. In his discourse about husbands and wives, he says this, In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So Paul draws an analogy there between the marriage of a husband and wife and the relationship between Christ and the church. And that's a truth that we find in the New Testament. But we can broaden that out even further to extend to the people of God in both the New and the Old Testaments. And we can see that the entire storyline of Scripture is that of God pursuing his unfaithful bride and continually renewing his covenant with her. Remember that a covenant is a bond or an agreement that is struck between two parties. In biblical terms, a covenant is even stronger than what we would call a contract. People break contracts all the time with little consequence. A covenant, however, is intended to be a solemn oath that is not easily broken. The Old Testament can be read as a series of covenants between God and his people that are continually broken by the people, but renewed by God. At the very beginning of Genesis, God places Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and promises that they will live in absolute harmony with him, as long as they don't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. Adam and Eve agree to this, and for a time they live in absolute fellowship with their Heavenly Father, and they lack absolutely nothing. But then they promptly break that agreement when the serpent sneaks in with words of deception. They eat from the tree and immediately realize that they've just transgressed against God. They become afraid and ashamed, so they hide. But how does God respond? Does he fly into a rage and immediately vaporize Adam and Eve? 
No, while he isn't pleased and their sin brings about a curse on all creation, God chooses to keep them physically alive, and he even clothes them with animal skins. He displays mercy and grace when what they really deserved was immediate death. But their sin doesn't go without immediate discipline. Adam and Eve are banished from the Garden of Eden and thus exiled from the presence of God. So with that first episode of rebellion, exile, and mercy, that sets a pattern for what we see throughout the rest of the Bible as it tells the story of God's relationship with his unfaithful people. Several hundred years later, God makes a covenant with Abraham and says that Abraham's descendants will inhabit the Promised Land. But what do we have with Abraham and his children? More rebellion. More of God having to discipline his people and restore a fractured relationship. Several generations after that, God comes to Moses and has him lead his people out of Egyptian captivity and towards the promised land. But just a few days after God delivers them in miraculous fashion through the Red Sea, the people start to grumble and question why they'd been led into the desert to die. Despite that, God gives them water to drink and manna from heaven to eat. He provides for them and doesn't allow Moses to get fed up with them. God later makes a covenant with Moses and the Hebrew people from Mount Sinai. The Ten Commandments, as well as the many other laws that went with it, were the stipulations of that covenant. So at that point in history, God gave his people very clear, a very clear set of standards that were meant to make them a holy people and deepen their fellowship with God. But before Moses even got down from the mountain, they had already set up and were bowing down to a golden calf. So God disciplined them by killing many of them, but he left a remnant. Then fast forward several hundred more years later, and you can see Israel's disobedience and idolatry during the time of the prophets. Every one of the prophets tried to call the Israelites out of rebellion and back into their covenant relationship with God. When that didn't work, God disciplined them by sending them into exile by the Assyrians and later the Babylonians. Much of the time throughout Israel's long history, if God was disciplining them, it was because they were bowing down to idols. They were giving honor and glory to created things rather than to their creator. They were seeking comfort and protection from other gods rather than the God who said, I will be your God and you will be my people. And it's easy for us modern-day Christians to read the Old Testament and think, how could God's people have been so dense? Why did they keep making the same mistakes? But we have to remember that their mistakes are our mistakes, too. Times and practices may have changed, but sinful human nature hasn't changed one bit. Most modern people don't bow down to statues anymore. But we do find ourselves committing subtle forms of idolatry, which the Bible likens to spiritual adultery, by giving our time and money and attention to the things of this world. Last week, we looked at the various ways that the world system, which the Bible calls Babylon, lures us away from God and into the vain pursuits that lead to spiritual death. Satan doesn't have to send persecutors after us. He just has to lead us into distractions and seemingly harmless activities that dull our spiritual senses and lull us to sleep. His attacks are much more subtle than much of us imagine. And sometimes he's so successful that he causes those who seemed like faithful believers at one time to go astray. But if they are indeed true believers then God relentlessly pursues them. He does not allow his true bride to run off with other lovers. So while God's people are rebellious and his discipline of them is constant, is a constant pattern that we see running throughout the Old Testament, there is another element to that pattern that we shouldn't overlook, and that is God's steadfast love. In most English Bibles, whenever you see the phrase steadfast love in the Old Testament, that's almost always a translation of the Hebrew word chesed. Just as with the Greeks, the Hebrew people had more than one term for the word love. 
And hesed was a very particular word that the biblical authors used to express not just any love, but God's love for his people that was based on his covenant with them. In other words, chesed love is not based on how lovable God's people are at any given moment, but rather is rooted in God's irrevocable decision to love. Chesed love is the kind of love that you pledge to your spouse when you exchange wedding vows at the altar. And that's why the metaphor of God's people as his bride is so appropriate. In eternity past, God had pledged, already pledged himself to his people. And once the earth was created, he made that pledge known to them through various covenants, so that for every new generation of his people, he reassures them, just as he reassured Joshua, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Therefore, even when God's people rebel, Even when they go chasing after other gods, he loves them with a steadfast, immovable love. God wants a close, intimate relationship with his people. But oftentimes we try to keep him at arm's length. And there are two primary ways that believers try to distance distance themselves from God. The first is through rebellion or waywardness. And the second is through legalism. And we see both of those within the same story in the parable of the prodigal son. So if you will, hold your place in Revelation and turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. So the parable of the prodigal son, starting in verse 11. And Jesus said, there was a young man, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants." And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who had devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So in this parable, we have the embodiment of two different ways in which believers try to keep God at arm's length. We see the first way with the prodigal, rebellious son. His story is well known, not only in the pages of Scripture, but also in the real lives of countless men and women women who have professed faith in Christ and yet have spent much of their lives running away from God and doing everything they can to numb their spiritual senses. 
We see this in people who grew up in a Christian home and spent much of their early lives in church. And yet, something happens later in life that propels them away from God's people and into a lifestyle of waywardness. And I'm sure that we all know someone like that. And my encouragement to you would be to never stop praying for them. No matter how old and entrenched in their views they get, don't give up on them. Because if they really are his, then God's not giving up on them. And notice how the father responds in this parable. When he realizes that his long-lost son is returning home, he doesn't sit and wait for his son to come groveling at his feet. No, he gets up and he rushes out to meet him. The people who saw him probably thought he was being undignified. It would have seemed shameful for a man of his stature to go running after his son, who had been off living like a pagan and probably smelt like a pigsty. But the father didn't care about all that. All that he cared for was that his son, who was all but dead and lost, was now found. Now he was reunited to one that he loved with an unfailing kind of love. And his natural response was to want to celebrate that reunion. But the older brother was thinking not so fast. While the older brother in the parable, with the older brother in the parable, we see the second major way that believers try to keep Jesus at arm's length, and that is through legalism. The older brother was the perfect son on paper. He never ran away from home to squander his inheritance. He kept all the rules, never stepped out of line. There is just one problem, a big problem. His heart was full of bitterness and jealousy. Instead of being happy that his brother had finally returned, he immediately started feeling sorry for himself. He immediately made it all about him and how he never got to have a celebration with his friends. And while that may be true, lurking just beneath the surface was a sense of self-righteousness, a sense of entitlement that came with his good deeds. And while he had been with his father the entire time, we can be led to suspect that he was just as emotionally distant from his father as the younger brother was physically distant. And many of us church-going Christians can fall into that same sort of older brother mentality, a mentality that assumes that because we live the right way and we go to church and we're not involved in any of the big sins, then God must think pretty highly of us. But then if something doesn't go our way, if despite all our righteous deeds, our life gets hard, then we start to question God and think that we deserve better. And all the while, we become more and more bitter and find ourselves drifting further and further away from a deep relationship with God. God is not like your supervisor or your boss. When you're working for a supervisor, your value is based almost solely upon the quantity and quality of your work. In the eyes of your company or your supervisor, you're merely merely a productivity machine. And if you do what they perceive to be bad work, well, then you eventually find yourself unemployed. But it's not like that with God. God is your loving, heavenly Father. He's not your work supervisor. He's not the CEO of your company. He just, who just wants to make a profit. God values you for you, not for what you can bring to the table. God loves you, not the offerings that you attempt to bring to the altar. God wants a relationship with you infinitely more than he wants a stockpile of good works. So those are the two ways that God's people have tried to keep their distance from God ever since the beginning of time. And yet, we see time and time again that God does not give up on his people. But if we only read the Old Testament, it would seem as if that's simply what God's people are destined to do for eternity, to be caught in that cycle of rebellion and discipline and exile and restoration and then rebellion again. And when we get to the New Testament, the way that God deals with his people fundamentally changes. God knew that his people could not stay in a right relationship with him for very long, that there would always be some new occasion for their falling away. So he would always be at enmity with them. Therefore, he chose to demonstrate and make solid his chesed love for his people 
by sending his only begotten son. In a sense, God pursued his prodigal children by sending Jesus to live and die for us. The church, which is composed of all those who believe in Jesus, is the bride of Christ. So the image that we should have in our minds is that of God coming down from heaven to find his long-lost bride and to bring her back and restore her to her right relationship with him. And that image is encapsulated so well in a hymn written by Samuel J. Stone that goes like this. It says, The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. From heaven he came and sought her. That was God's response to the waywardness and the legalism of his lost bride. We had neither the desire nor the power to reconcile ourselves to God, but he did. And he did it not because of anything lovable in us, but because he chose to love us. God had instituted various covenants throughout the Old Testament era with Israel that were meant to be an expression of the fellowship between God and his people. But as we already saw, the common theme with all of those was that God's people never held to their end of the bargain. They always fell short, though God always remained faithful. But when God sent his son, who would live a sinless life, die on the cross, rise again on the third day, he instituted a new covenant that was unlike all those that had come before. It was a covenant that was based completely on God's faithfulness, not ours. It was the covenant that promised God's people that they would be united to him for eternity when Christ returned at the end of the age. And if we think about it in terms of that marriage metaphor, then Christ's first advent was like his betrothal to his bride, the church. And most of us modern Americans don't really have a clear concept of what a betrothal is. For first century Jews, the betrothal was the first stage in a Jewish wedding. It's kind of like our understanding of an engagement, only even more serious than that. To, a betroth to be betrothed to someone means that you are now legally bound to them. So even though the couple was not yet technically married and living as a married couple, they were considered legally obligated to one another until the time of the marriage ceremony, which sometimes wouldn't be until a year later. If we want to map the stages of a Jewish wedding onto the history of God's people, then the church age, the, the, church, the age in which we're living now, can be considered the betrothal period. God's people have not yet been married and united to God. But we have been promised with an unbreakable pledge that we will be one day. The betrothal period is a time of preparation. For the Christian church, that means that it's a time of trial and suffering and even persecution. And as we've already seen in Revelation, God doesn't shield us from tribulation, but he does allow us to be refined and sanctified through tribulation. And he ensures that we make it through to the other side. So all throughout Scripture, there are allusions and metaphors that relate God's people to a bride and God or Christ to a husband. But there is another metaphor or theme that we see throughout Scripture, which is that of the great end-time feast. This eschatological feast is something that God's people have been looking forward to, at least since the time of the prophets. And we see glimpses of it, especially in Isaiah. In Isaiah 25, the prophet says this, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The great end-time feast is also prefigured in the Jewish Passover meal, which is itself picked up by Jesus and given an even more profound meaning. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is sharing his last Passover meal with his disciples just before he goes to the cross. And starting in verse 26, we read this. 
Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for, many, for, many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That scene in the upper room was not only the institution of the Lord's Supper, but a prophecy of the end-time feast that the church would enjoy with Christ when God's kingdom would reach its fullness. And to quote one more gospel writer, Mark chapter 2, people come to Jesus and ask him about fasting. Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. So the entire witness of Scripture is telling us that the great end-time banquet will occur at the consummation of God's kingdom, and it will take place in the presence of Jesus himself, who will feast alongside with us. And scriptures like the one that I just read in Mark 2 show us that the great end-time feast will also be the long-anticipated wedding feast of the Lamb of God. So John is assuming that God's people should have all of that background scripture in their minds as they now look at Revelation 19 which again says the marriage of the Lamb has come, and blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So all of God's dealings with his people have been leading up to this point. It's what the Old Testament and New Testament saints have prayed for, and it's what the martyrs throughout the centuries have died in hope of. It's the second coming of Jesus and the presentation of the church for union with him forever. N.T. Wright puts it well when he writes, This is what the world has been waiting for ever since Genesis 1, ever since the covenant with Abraham, which always envisaged the birth of a family, ever since the covenant with Moses, ever since the renewal of the covenant promised at the time of the exile. Marriage is the ultimate covenant. Jesus is the ultimate bridegroom. On that day, after Satan, sin, and death had been overthrown, after God has remade heaven and earth, the church, the bride of Christ, will finally get to see her groom face to face. And she and every creature in heaven and on earth will celebrate. And we'll give even more attention to that in the next few weeks. But for now, let's focus in on verse 8. It was granted her, the bride, to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So what hinders every single person who does not know Christ from fellowship with God is their lack of righteousness. They're falling short of the glory of God. And that's also what hindered all of us who are now Christians from true fellowship with God before we were born again. Remember that God is absolutely holy. And in order for anyone to approach God's throne, they must also be holy. But none of us have the power in and of ourselves to do even one purely righteous deed. Our natural hearts are corrupted with sin, so that everything we do is tainted with sinful motives. So the gospel, the good news, is not simply that we are invited to the throne or the marriage supper. If that were all the gospel was, it would be a cruel joke. God would be inviting us to something that he knew that we would never be able to attend because our sinful hearts wouldn't allow it. It would be like inviting a homeless man to a fancy dinner at a five-star restaurant and not offering to provide him with the appropriate clothes or offering to pay for his meal. That invitation would be an act of mockery rather than a true gift. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is not simply that you are invited to the feast, but that you have been given everything you need to participate in the feast. You don't have the necessary righteousness, but Christ has clothed you with his righteousness. He has given and will give you everything you need to enjoy fellowship with him without shame or guilt or regret. And this is yet another Old Testament prophecy that is fulfilled in the last day. Isaiah 61.10 says this, 
I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall, shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. So we are able to come to the feast, not because we're spotless super-Christians, but because God chose to clothe us with the righteousness of his Son. And when it comes to these white garments, there are at least two different images that we should have in our minds, one of which we've already been thinking about, the white garments of a bride on our wedding day. But also we should be thinking about the white garments of priests who served in the temple. In Old Testament Israel, the priests were the only ones allowed to serve in the tabernacle and later in the temple. And of course, their priestly garments were composed of white robes. And this is an image that we've already seen a few times in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 7, starting in verse 13, it says this, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. And it's this assurance of being clothed by Christ that led the writer of Hebrews to say this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed pure, washed with pure water. When it comes to seeing Jesus face to face on the last day, despite every sin that we've committed, we'll be ready because he will make us ready. And this is not to say that we don't strive to be holy or that we just live however we feel, but that any righteousness in us comes I'm sorry, any righteousness that is in us or comes out of us through our good deeds is not ours, but Christ's. Your Christian life is one big act of grace from start to finish. Remember why God has made this possible, why he has chosen to clothe you with the righteousness of his son and invite you to the great wedding feast, because he wants fellowship with you. He wants a relationship with you. And that's really what the entire Christian life is about. We have perfect communion with him one day in the future. But even now, we should seek communion with him, however imperfect it might be. The purpose of your life as a Christian is not to check boxes on religious activities. I read my Bible. Check. I prayed this morning. Check. I went to church. Check. It's not about that. It's okay, guys. Focus. Rather, the purpose of your life as a Christian is to continually grow in your relationship with Christ, to be in fellowship or communion with him. Now, that's going to manifest itself in outward ways. You're going to find yourself reading your Bible and praying and going to church and serving others. But none of that is the main point. The main point is fellowship with God. So that's the overarching question that we can ask ourselves on a daily basis to get to the heart of the matter. How is my fellowship with God today? We shouldn't base everything on feelings, but your emotions are a good indicator of how you're doing spiritually. If you're sulky and angry all the time, that's a sign that your communion with God isn't where it should be. You might be his blood-bought child, but in moments like that, you're not acting like one. Or it might be something more subtle, like depression or anxiety or fear. None of that comes from God. As Paul says in Romans 8.15, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. In the moments that you're feeling depressed and anxious, those aren't the times to stiff-arm God and try to do things on your own. It's in those moments especially that we need to cry out to our Heavenly Father. We need to seek His wisdom and comfort and love. 
But we should never feel down on ourselves if, we, if our fellowship with God in this life never feels perfect. It's never going to feel perfect. And that's precisely why we long for Jesus to return. It's only when we see him face to face and feast with him that we shall be truly satisfied. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'll close today with the words of Psalm 36, verses 7 through 9. It says, How precious is your steadfast love, O God! The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light.